Hey guys, good morning. So this is part two of our retreat this weekend on hope, especially hope during this Advent season. And last night we had our great talk from Peter Dion all about barrenness. So the idea that this place that we start from, that Christ comes to meet us, is the place of our vulnerability, our emptiness in this place where we're bearing. So from the time that we turned away from God in, the, in Genesis, original sin, from that moment on, this sense of barrenness and needing God has always been there. This sense that without Him we're empty, we're broken, and we're in this desperate need for someone to come and bring us that hope that we're searching for. So as we can begin, we're going to begin with a prayer, and then we'll jump into the second talk all about how God speaks into that place of barrenness. So it's going to be in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear God, we thank you for this weekend. We thank you for this time. We thank you for the gift of hope, the gift of your, your life in each one of us. We ask for you to build up our hope, to build up our trust in you. Help us to believe that an encounter with you isn't an encounter with just a set of ideas or morals or, or a set of beliefs, but it's an encounter with a person, a person who loves us, a person who wants intimacy with us, and a person who wants to come and meet us right where we are. We ask this in your name. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So guys, today is actually a really special feast day. As you guys know, the other day, uh, December 8th, we had the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of our Blessed Mother, right? So big feast day, because it's all about how God was preparing, this, preparing Mary for the great mission He had for her life. And the same way He prepares us from the moment we're conceived for a mission in each one of our lives. How God has a dream before we're even conceived, conceived in our mother's womb. And today's another special feast day for Mary. It's the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, December 12th. And many of us know that image, that famous image of Mary, Our Lady of Guadalupe. And a lot of us, when we see it, first thing we think is Mexico or Central America, right? Because that's where it happened 500 years ago, was in Mexico, near Mexico City. But she's really the patroness of all the Americas. So not just Mexico, not just Central America, but all of the Americas, including North America. So Our Lady of Guadalupe is also our patron as well, and such a powerful intercessor for us right now in this time. And Our Lady of Guadalupe is a story that many of us know. This Aztec man who was a recent convert to Christianity, Juan Diego, he encounters Mary in a miraculous way, and Mary asks for him to take these roses, these flowers, that are blooming in the winter, flowers that wouldn't normally bloom in that time of the year in Mexico. And she places them in his mantle, in his tilma, on the inside of his tilma, and she asks him to take them to the bishop and to ask the bishop to build a church on that spot. So he does what Mary asks him to do. He takes the flowers. When he opens his tilma, the flowers fall, and there in his tilma is this miraculous image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, an image that is a miracle in and of itself. Because the tilma itself, made of cactus fibers, a normal tilma like that wouldn't have lasted more than 15 to 20 years in its best conditions. But this tilma, the tilma of Our Lady Guadalupe, has lasted nearly 500 years. And to, today, if you go to Mexico City, you can go to the Basilica of Guadalupe and see the tilma on display there in Guadalupe. And so many millions of people go there each year to pray, to honor our Blessed Mother, and to draw closer to her child. So this image of Our Lady Guadalupe, such a powerful image because of the effect it had in Mexico at that time. Because just 10 years prior to this, the, the Spaniards first came to Mexico, right? They're coming to explore and they're bringing with them Christianity. And the Aztecs of the time didn't have the same view of God that the Christians had. So the Aztec view of God was very vengeful and, and a God who was power hungry, a God who wanted the blood of the people, right? They even sacrificed their own children to this God, human sacrifice, to worship this God, right? This God who didn't have love for his children, that didn't, he wasn't seen as a, a good father, right? And the Christians come in and they see this is a dangerous way to view God, right? Who the Aztecs view. But in those first 10 years of being there, they made very little headway in converting the Aztecs to Christianity and teaching them the truth of who God is. So 10 years in, very little headway, very little advancement in carrying, out, carrying this Christian message to the people there. And our Lady of Guadalupe comes, and this miracle occurs. And in the next 10 years, over 9 million Aztec people convert to Christianity. Essentially, the entirety of that country converts to Christianity after 10 years. And the power of this image is so beautiful because it's our Lady bringing hope 
into this place of darkness, into this place of barrenness. If you look at the image itself, everything about the image points to who Mary has in her womb. Because if you look at her waist there and you see the belt around her waist, that belt is a symbol for a woman who is pregnant, a woman who is with child. So the Aztecs seeing this image, they see that this woman has a baby. And all about this image, there are different signs and symbols that the Aztecs saw that pointed them to God. Even the different aspects around Mary. She's in front of the sun. She's on top of the moon. She has stars all across her mantle. All of these things were seen as gods for the Aztec people. The stars, the moon, the sun. And looking at the image, they see that this woman is greater than those gods. Is greater than those na that natural phenomena of the moon, the stars, the sun. That this woman is greater. And also, if you look at Mary, her hands are folded in prayer and her head is bowed in reverence to show that there is someone greater than her, to show that she isn't the God that's greater than these things. But it's the child that she has in her womb that she's bringing in humility and compassion for the people that gives the people hope. And this image of Our Lady Guadalupe is a symbol of hope, not just for the Mexican people, but for all people. Our Lady of Guadalupe is also called La Morena, the brown woman. She's also seen as not as being a Spaniard and not as being an Aztec, but as a mixture of the two cultures. She has aspects of both identities, of both cultures, to show that she isn't just one side or another, but she comes to unite the two nations together, to unite them in her son, this child that she has in her womb, the source of hope. What a beautiful image. And there's two things I want to highlight about Our Lady Guadalupe that she teaches us about hope. And the first one is, that God is personal, that he's not this abstract idea, that he's not something, but he's someone, that he wants this closeness, this intimacy, and that is what gives us hope. For the Aztec people, like I said, God was far away. God was just this power-hungry ruler that they had to please by offering human sacrifice. But Our Lady Guadalupe comes to show that this God that she brings forth, this God that comes close, greater than the sun, greater than the moon, greater than the stars, isn't a God seeking power, but it's a God that humbles himself to come and touch the people, to come and show the people how much they are loved, how God brings hope in a personal way. And sometimes we forget that. I know we know that intellectually, but in the depths of our heart, do we know that this God become, became one of us in the incarnation? He even becomes a piece of bread at Mass, what looks like a piece of bread, so that he can be as intimate with us as humanly possible, to be one flesh with us. So that's the first thing. Our hope is rooted in that God doesn't want to stay far away. He's not abstract, but he's deeply personal. He's deeply concrete in our daily lives, if we have the eyes to see. And the second thing I want to highlight is that hope is a person. That it's not just a set of ideals. It's not just a sense that things are going to be okay. Because it's not abstract and it's not vague at all. It's a promise. And when, it's, when a promise is made, it comes from a person. And Jesus promises us that I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. That's one of my favorite Bible verses. John 10, chapter 10, verse 10. I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. And isn't that what each of us desires in the depths of our heart? Is to have life and have it fully, right? Even when we get a little taste of life, right? Of happiness, of joy. We get a little taste of it, whether it be a great meal with our family, whether it be a weekend with our spouse whether it be reading a great book and watching a sunset at the beach, whatever it is, we have these images, these encounters with beauty, with joy, with happiness, and God gives us little tastes of it to show us that he's carrying us through, that he's given us this taste of joy and life that we want to the fullest, right? Because the weekend comes to an end, the sunset ends, the book ends, right? The time with our family comes to a close, right? Our kids have to move. But all these tastes of goodness and happiness and joy, our hearts feel like they long for that to last. Our hearts long for that to last eternally, right? We want this eternal joy, this eternal life. And Jesus promises it to us. His promise is what we, what we place our hope in. The whole story of Christmas is all about God fulfilling his promise. He made this promise to Adam and Eve to eventually crush the head of the serpent. And he made this promise, and for thousands of years, the Jewish people are waiting. And then finally, in the fullness of time, God comes, becomes one of us in this little baby born in a small town 
in this humble place, this humble cave, in the most in the dirtiest place you can be born in, a manger, a feed box for animals, where all the slobber and saliva and nasty stuff gets thrown in there. And that's where God becomes one of us. He could, And C.S. Lewis, a great author, he used to say that God came behind enemy lines so that he would pass unnoticed by the world, so that he could pass unnoticed and allow us to open our hearts to him. What beauty, how God humbles himself in that way to show us that hope is trust in a person. Not just what people tell us, not a set of rules, but it's a promise that he's guiding us, that he's journeying with us, that we're not alone in this journey. That's what hope means. And that's what our Lady of Guadalupe brought to the Aztec people at the time. That's where Lady Guadalupe brings to us today. That she's with us, greater than all the obstacles, greater than all the false gods in our lives, greater than all the barrenness and darkness that we face, to show us that she's carrying with us the one who gives us hope. And I pray that this Christmas, this Advent season, our Lady Guadalupe fills us with that thrill of hope. That hope that drives us forward, right? That hope that only Christ can bring. Because there's a lot going on in the world right now. There's a lot going on in our families, in our communities, in our school, in our world, right? But Our Lady Guadalupe brings Christ in the midst of that darkness of Mexico at the time. Even when people didn't know who God was, she was bringing them to God to them to show them who he was and in turn to show them who they were in the depths of their heart. So may this Christmas, when we encounter Christ in a deep, personal way, be filled with that hope, that trust in a person, and know that it's not abstract, that it's deeply concrete and deeply intimate. And that's what Christ wants for each one of us. So have a blessed Advent, have a beautiful rest of this weekend retreat, and God bless you. Our Lady Guadalupe, pray for us.